right, welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join my session. Uh, Mindless Multitasking, a Dummies Guide to Productivity. I'm going to start with introductions. I'm curious how many uh, programmers we have in the room. Wonderful. What about agency owners or managers? A few marketers? Any other job titles I missed? Okay, so we've got a pretty diverse group of people. I imagine you're all from different uh, you know, countries as well. Myself, I'm from uh, Vancouver, Canada, and I'm a digital uh, PM. I'm also a director of business analysis and a group of quality assurance uh, analysts. It's a bit of a mouthful of title. I'm also a yoga teacher as well. And I've been practicing for about 20 years and teaching for 10. And my yoga has always kept me uh, balanced in the workplace. I've been working in uh, tech for about 20 years as well. I want to ask also, how many of you have experienced stress in the workplace? Okay, if you haven't, I want to talk to you after to really find out what your secrets are. <laughs> so in this next 15, 20 minutes together, um, we're going to um, talk about what the effects of multitasking are on your productivity. Understanding the signs of stress in your body, and this could be different for everybody, I'm going to share more of my personal story. We're going to learn how to jumpstart your productivity, and also um, I want you to hopefully leave us some ideas on improving your well-being. So what is multitasking? You know, I can see some people on their phones right now, that's okay, I'm assuming you must be taking notes. Uh, maybe you have a computer open, maybe you're taking notes, handwriting, um, but in this busy 24-hour day connected world, we have our devices with us we feel like we always have to be switched on. At least I do many times. So there's, there's certain things or types of multitasking that are easy enough to do together. For example, I can make dinner and talk to my sister on the phone. It's usually I don't you know, burn anything. Or, but however, I'm not really fully present with the conversation at all times, and I may not be fully paying attention to what I'm doing when I'm cooking dinner. There are other types of multitasking where it could be a little bit more dangerous. For example, if you're texting and driving, or putting makeup on and driving, or reading a book and driving. Um, I'm a cyclist. I, I ride my bike to work most days. We don't have quite the setup as we do here in Amsterdam with cycle lanes. I think this is fabulous here. So sometimes we have to share the road with drivers. And the one time I was clipped, it was a minor accident by a car, the person was on their phone. So texting and driving do not mix. Please don't do it. But coming into the workplace, so how many of you can relate to this? You arrive, you've got your morning coffee in hand, you might take a couple of morning calls, you might even check your email on that call, check your Slack messages, um, I see some of you nodding, yes. Um, you finish, you, you maybe take another call, you talk to some of your colleagues, go get another coffee, and, and constantly they're, they're, you're switching, context switching into your emails, your instant messaging, your task at hand. Can anyone relate to that? Yes, I thought so. So, as you're going, you're juggling, we're juggling all of these tasks. And there are some days, like, as an analyst, I need to have focused time. And if I have to write up uh, some complex requirements or I need some time to really just think, but I'm trying to also check my emails and take calls and answer all the instant messages, my time quickly goes away. And I find it's like 11 o'clock in the morning, I usually start quite early, and I feel like I've got nothing accomplished. And then there are other days where it's much better. I know I have this focus time, so I actually turn off Slack, close down the email, I set an hour and a half of time for myself, and I actually can focus and get something done. The morning still flies by, but I feel a little bit better about uh, what I've actually accomplished. So I'm actually a recovering multitasker. So I'm not saying here that multitasking is terrible and you should never do it. You know, there are times when it's necessary, it's life, right? We, we just need to adapt. But what I do want to share the message today is that you don't end up like this, just wanting to bury your head at the computer. And, and that really multitasking is something to be aware of, to catch yourself when you're doing it. And uh, hopefully it doesn't become a habit, because we'll learn a little bit later what happens when you're constantly working at this fast pace and shifting from task to task to task. So what the research says, even though this is mostly about my own personal experience, I did want to make sure there was some research to, to back it up. And uh, 
this goes back to a study that was done in the American Psychological Association um, by David Myers and his colleagues. And so they studied uh, participants in the 90s, early 2000s. So again, this is not brand new information. We know that multitasking is really not good for us when consistently done day after day. And even mental blocks, like even brief mental blocks can be uh, seen by you know, shifting between tasks. It can cost you as much as 40% of your time. So even if you're familiar with these tasks, in this study, they set up uh, a, a control group and, of people that were not going to multitask, and another group of people who were self-proclaimed uh, multitaskers, and they asked them to perform a series of tasks. So one was solving simple math problems and classifying geometric shapes. And they had the, the two groups switch very rapidly for math problem, geometric shape, solve the math problem, geometric, you know, classify these shapes. Whereas the control group just focused on the math problems. And they found that even if they were very simple problems and the people were very skilled and knew what they were doing, they still lost time, context switching. As the problems got more complex, as you can probably guess, you know, they lost even more time because they were in the middle, as I mentioned earlier, of you know, a complex uh, uh, problem or writing up requirements. You need to be in that flow of working and in that flow uh, of, of really uh, allowing your thoughts to go down one continuous path versus jumping around. So you may not feel like it, you may feel like you're getting a lot done, but you're actually slowly losing time. So how does this manifest in your day-to-day, -day, in your body? Well, for me personally, um, being a project manager, juggling multiple projects in an agency, and you know, going for, having to get things done for deadlines, of course, uh, stress was starting to build up in my body. And I've worked at uh, other companies in the past where maybe the project management has not been the best. So deadlines are very rapid. Can you turn this around in 24 hours? You know, somebody missed something. And that, that happens, I get it. But when that cons consistently happens and you're constantly reacting, um, some of these symptoms of stress, uh, and there's physical, cognitive, and emotional signs of stress, but they can start to build up in your body. For me, I was uh, struggling with, with headaches. I was carrying a lot of tension in my shoulders, in my jaw. I was grinding my teeth at night. Um, and then eventually it led into uh, stomach issues, just digestive problems. And, but I didn't put all of this together until I had to go to the doctor to say, you know what, I feel sick. And I was getting a lot of colds and, and my immune system was basically really run down. At that time, the doctor said, oh, you must be suffering from anxiety or depression. I was like, no way, I'm, I'm not depressed. And he said, well, I'm gonna give you antidepressants. And I said, well, okay, I'll try it, but I'm really uncomfortable with this. I tried it, it actually had an adverse effect. It kept me up all night and the headaches got worse. I wasn't dealing with the root of the problem, which was my own self-induced um, having to get everything done now and you know, trying to, basically trying to do it all. So after a week of being on those uh, antidepressants, I, I stopped and I realized, okay, this is actually something I can control. This is where the yoga came in. So this is going back quite a few years. Uh, at that time, I'd been practicing for a number of years and I, I decided to go and uh, quit my job. I left everything and, and went to India to pursue yoga teacher training. And that's where it took a bit more of a, a detour in my life, but a turn for the best. I, I you know, had the luxury of, of escaping, let's say, my responsibilities. I spent a month in an ashram in northern India and really dove deeply into yoga and really started to learn about the mind-body connection and how that my thoughts, you know, my racing thoughts and having to tell myself I have to get this done um, and I, you know, I have to get everything done now, were leading to the physical symptoms in my body. So not everyone has the luxury to take off for a month and go and study yoga, but there are some things that you can do uh, even today, and we're going to talk about that. The first thing is to, if you find yourself multitasking and, and you know like you're not on a hard deadline, if you catch yourself, I'd say you just stop and realize that you're doing it. And it's not about beating yourself up and, oh, I'm doing it again, because, you know, I still get caught up in it from time to time. 
I'm not going to beat myself up, but when I, I do catch myself, I just stop, take a quick break, and then simply move on. Another thing you can do to help uh, get back into the flow and, and streamline your productivity is to eliminate distractions. And that could be, for example, if you are in like an office situation, even if you're working from home, maybe put your cell phone away, like out of, out of view, unless you need to be on some kind of an emergency or on-call situation. You know, I understand that. But try to just remove the distractions. Even cleaning up clutter on your desk uh, can help uh, clear your mind. Another thing you can do is, how many people have to-do lists here? And how many people have those to-do lists that just keep going and going and you don't really ever tick anything off of it? <laughs> yes, I do too. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, it's something that's maybe not due right away, but it's maybe not organized. So I've taken time to organize my to-do list and also make them action-oriented. So for example, if you're working on a project, like Smith project, and you look back at your to-do list, that's kind of meaningless. You know, it, it doesn't really help you remember even what you have to do on that project. But if you say something like complete um, X deliverable on Smith project by, you know, October 30th, that's a little more concrete and refined. So you can start to organize your list that way and push down those things and those tasks that are really not critical. And I feel that doing this, it's a, it may sound so simple, but it, it just helps me organize and it, it's not as overwhelming. I can see, okay, well, today I've only got maybe three things I really must do. The rest can wait till the end of the week. So it's all about prioritizing. It helps to take away some of those feelings of overwhelm. Another thing you can do is delegate. So for those of you that are in a position, even if you're not a manager, you know, we all work with teams. Typically, there are other people on your team that can help you and assuming they're not overwhelmed. But I think delegating is really good, is finding those tasks that are easy to delegate. And some people, when I was talking with a friend about this the other day, they said, well, it takes more time to, to delegate and explain the task to someone else. I might as well do it myself. I said, well, yes, that might be true. Either that's not the right task to delegate, or maybe you don't trust this other person to get it done. And while it might take a little bit of time up front to explain it, once that person not only um, gains more experience if they start taking on other tasks, they, they also, um, after some time, it takes that time away from you. So you have your time freed up now to get to those other things on your to-do list. So you're really spreading the workload amongst your team. And also, especially if you're mentoring like a junior team, you help people uh, step up and learn and grow in their careers. So really, you don't have to do it all. So some ways to reduce your stress. So I think pretty much everybody raised their hand earlier and said they've experienced stress, myself included. So a couple of simple tools here, and this isn't, I think, ground, it's not groundbreaking, you know, earth shattering new information that you've never heard, I'm quite sure. But I'm here to remind you, and that's really all it takes is to have a reminder to do these simple things in order to make your day go a little bit more smoothly. So what you can do is set a benchmark for a break. Whether some people work differently, I know some people like to have two, three hours solid, they're just going to focus and get a task done. That's totally fair. Just remember to take a break. For me, my limit's about an hour to an hour and a half if I'm focusing on something that's uh, requiring me to be very much in flow. But I, I make a note, a mental note, if I have a, an open block of time where I don't have a lot of meetings, um, try to get my meetings done in the morning. And I know I've got an hour and a half to focus. I, I know I'm going to take a break after five minutes, and I'm going to just get up and move, do something, get a glass of water, go for a quick walk, even stretch. And if, if you're one of those people that's kind of cringing when I'm saying this, and it's like, I don't have five minutes every hour to do this, well, then take two minutes, take one minute, even just something to move and, and do something different to switch your mind um, will help. Uh, hydration is important as well. It's even if you're slightly dehydrated, it, it can affect your mental faculties and your ability to focus. So remember to drink lots of water or orange juice. Another thing that's a great stress reducer is remembering to laugh more. So how many of you work with um, a group of people and there's usually like one or two people in the office that you know you can just joke around with no matter what? Well, you know what? Talk to that person. Don't see them as a distraction as they're taking me away from my work. Just have a laugh. And, and it's really, uh, when you're laughing, you're releasing endorphins. It's, it's taking away from all of the serious business of, I've got to get everything done now. 
Another one, and we've only got a few minutes left, but I want to take this opportunity uh, to do an exercise together. And it's breathing deeply. And we were talking about this before uh, the, the session started. So when you're feeling stress and anxiety, and you know, you've been contact switching all day, your breathing chances are is in your chest. And it's, it's consolidated to this area, which is okay for a short time, but over time, what you're telling your body is that in your, you're in a state of stress or panic. Now, in, thousands of years ago, you know, the, the adrenal glands kick, kick in when you're running away from a tiger, let's say, and you know, your body's sy systems are there to warn you when you're in danger. But it's not natural to be breathing that way and having the cortisol levels released from your adrenal glands um, every moment of every day. So I want you to put down anything that's on your lap, to set it aside, sit up nice and straight, place both of your feet firmly on the, on the ground. You're welcome to close your eyes or keep them open. This will be about one minute or less. And if you are feeling at all uncomfortable during this, just return to your normal breathing. So whether your eyes are closed or open, rest your hands comfortably on your lap. I want you to breathe in for a count of three. So inhaling for one, two, three, pause. Exhale for three, two, one. Now keep breathing along that time. I want you to imagine you're filling up your lower belly with your breath, then your rib cage, then your chest. As you pause, imagine you're releasing the breath from your chest, your rib cage, and then your belly. So just continue on for about another 30 seconds. I'll let you know when your time is up. Just enjoy some deep breathing. Just relaxing your face, releasing your jaw. allowing your shoulders to drop. And then together we're gonna to take a nice deep breath in Filling fully with breath, opening your eyes, and then release. Is anyone still feeling stressed? <laughs> so it's a simple exercise. It's just remembering to breathe. And this is something that you can do anytime and in any place. You don't have to be in a yoga studio to do this. You can do it right at your desk. But it's just remembering to do it. And Hopefully you felt something different than before you did that breathing exercise. Hopefully you're, you might feel a little bit more relaxed. So with, with a couple of minutes left, um, in summary we talked about multitasking, how it's not good for you, uh, for your mental or physical health, is in my experience. Um, hopefully you know the signs of stress. Pay attention next time you have a stomach ache, headache, you're feeling fatigued. Maybe you have a bug or maybe it's stress. Hopefully you remember some of those tools to jumpstart your productivity, such as cleaning up your to-do list, setting some goals, delegating. And hopefully you remember, if nothing else, to breathe deeply and relax. So if you have any questions, we have about a one minute left before I think the next session gets started. Ah, so that's a good question. So she asked, how do I deal with back-to-back -back meetings? Something we, we recently uh, implemented at our company was to book, f like, if it's one hour, book for 50 minutes. So you have a 10-minute breather in between. And usually, quite often I should say, that you still get it that close to the hour. So if it's from 10 to 11, uh, you know, it's five minutes to 11. Usually I'm chairing these meetings, so I, if you're the chair, great. If you're not, maybe you can ask the chair to do time checks. So to make sure that you do finish a few minutes early, so you actually get that breathing time. And that's something you can actually set in your Google Calendar as a default to 
chop 10 minutes off or chop five minutes off the uh, half hour meeting. Thank you. And one more thing, uh, which tools do you use for to do this? Anything like you use in person or you just amending it? Uh, to do what, sorry? The to -do, yeah. oh, to do lists. Uh, everything I have is in Evernote. And we also use Basecamp as well for our client communications. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I handwrite a lot too. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, folks. We're at time. Thank you so much for joining me.